Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 51st episode of GBR. And it's nice to be back from Winter Nam. Like most, I needed a full day to recover, and I didn't even have to travel, except for the 20-minute drive from my place to the Anaheim Convention Center. And I have to tell you, it was worth the $40 a day to park at the Marriott Hotel parking lot. I mean, I needed to have access to my car during the day, so that was my reason for shelling out the extra bucks. But the universe delivered in some other really amazing ways. First, Thursday and Friday are typically really heavy traffic days going from where I am to the convention center on the freeway. Yet for some unexplained reason, Leaving at 7.15 a.m. to compensate for what I thought was going to be a long and tedious drive, to my shock, there was absolutely no traffic either day. So I got there very early. Then when I got into the parking structure, it was so full, I was thinking, I'm really heading for the outskirts here. But making the first turn at the top of the first level, there was one space vacant only a few steps from the hotel entrance. I couldn't believe it, but definitely expressed my gratitude. Friday morning, exactly the same thing. No traffic and a parking stall just two spaces down from the one I had on Thursday. Unbelievable. Saturday, of course, there would be no traffic short of an accident or something like that. But once again, I was able to park about 20 yards away from the previous day's space. So as it turned out, getting in and out of the show was the easiest part. But you know, it was all good. Three full days there, seeing so many folks that I rarely get to see, and especially many of those who I've interviewed in the past. Just great. Just great. I will say, however, that I'm sure that this was, in fact, the loudest NAM show I've ever attended, and I've been doing this close to four decades. My ears are still ringing, and I'm sure many others are experiencing the same thing. I remember years ago, in my medical days, my medical media days, joking about starting a new magazine called Tinnitus Today. Tinnitus Today. Maybe I should be reconsidering that. Or maybe somebody already has. Now, my doctor refers to this disorder as tinnitus. Tinnitus. Maybe that's the technical pronunciation. But I don't know. It's hard to imagine approaching someone and saying like, hey man, how's your tinnitus? Just not a good sounding thing. Anyway, NAM was fun, really tiring, but so worth it. Meanwhile, stick around after our interview today with Isaac Jang in our Back of the Show segment, where I'm going to be telling you more about something brand new from Guitar Business Media called Guitar Careers, and exactly what you can get right now for free. So, while we're contemplating what that's all about, my better sense is telling me that we better be moving on to something completely different. Well, Isaac Jang has been working on his guitar building career since he was about 18 years old. And now, barely into his 30s, he's already built a reputation as an outstanding and creative builder of high-end acoustic guitars. Now, operating out of a very small shop in Hollywood, California, his instruments are in so much demand that he has a waiting list to get on his waiting list. He has a fascinating story to tell, so let's just have him talk about it as Isaac Jang joins us right here and right now. Well, hey, Isaac, so great to have you on the show. Uh, I've been looking forward to having you on for some time. Welcome to GBR. Thank you so much for, to have me on your radio. I feel very honored and excited to be here. Well, that's great. Uh, me too. Me too. So uh, let's get started the way we normally do, and uh, I want to ask you about some of the things that were uh, most impactful growing up uh, for you and that contributed significantly to uh, getting you to where you are today. So thinking back, what can you tell us? Well, I am uh, from Korea. I'm from South Korea. And 
I grew up in Korea and I moved out to LA when I was 12. So I spent all my youth here in LA, middle school, high school, and college. And coming here with just you know a few luggages uh, with my parents and whole family. I came. I have a young and younger brother and mom and dad, and they've always been just really hardworking parents. Yeah, just you know go to work in the morning, come back home in the night. So I think a lot of it has probably been influenced by my parents' uh, work ethic. Sure, that's always and, important. That's always important. Yeah. So I think that's a big part of uh, who I am, where I come from. And, you know, I felt like I wasn't really an academic type of person. And I just like always doing hands-on. So I think also having fun has always been part of uh, you know, my approach. But also with fun, you got to add some real work into it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, my, I think that that's sort of a, kind of the – uh, starting place uh, from where I uh, come from. Well, having fun and loving what you do, you know, we agree that uh, those are critical, critical factors in, mm -hmm. in success and being able to create value uh, while you're doing that mm -hmm. is a good formula for success. Uh, what were some of the things uh, growing up that influenced you? Were you, in, did, were you involved in building anything or did you have an interest in music or guitar or anything along those lines that, uh, uh, that might have uh, pushed you toward uh, uh, doing what you're doing? I started playing guitar when I was in middle school at around 14. Okay. And I started at my local church playing just sort of a couple of cowboy chords. And I wanted to find out more about this. It just sort of triggered my curiosity. So I started actually playing electric guitars, learning all the skills and cool riffs, licks, and just, just getting more and more into it. And in my high school, that was actually before the YouTube came out, but I ran across this video clip of gentleman playing acoustic guitar, but he's just, he just played it like it was an electric guitar, just going all over the fingerboard and making it sound like a full band. So I really wanted to find out more about this man and later found out that his name was Tommy Emanuel. Well, sure, one of my favorites, and, one of my all-time favorites. And I, I was kind of thinking as you were describing that, that I was thinking of Tommy Emanuel. So um, right, <laughs> right on the same wavelength there. So uh, that I can see where that would have been a big influence. Yeah, so that sort of triggered my attention to acoustic guitars at that point. And digging more and more into about the guitar playing and acoustic guitars, the whole sound qualities of the acoustic guitars really intrigued me. So I wanted to just get more into it. And I did a lot of research to just w find out what it's all about. And then later found out there was a guitar making as part of a, a it's, it's possible. Like somebody actually could make a guitar with their hands and, that's how it's been done. I've never even thought about it. I always just thought you go to the music store and you see an acoustic guitar. Okay, that's a guitar. But <laughs> it just occurred to me. He's like, oh, you can make a guitar. It's a process. So it's, it's possible. So it's just literally from completely zero information, understanding of what's available and just, oh, it's possible. So I started to look around and, you know, find about luthiers, guitar makers. And I actually initially reached out uh, to this guitar maker in the area. Uh, her name was Kathy Wingert. Sure. And then sure. I later found out that she was a huge, I mean, she was a big deal. I mean, she's, you know, she's been, yeah, she's been building guitars for quite a while, built some incredible, beautiful guitars, but you know, knowing not much, I just like, Oh, cool. Maybe I reach <laughs> out to her and then see if I could learn something from her. And that was sort of towards my uh, end of high school. So just to kind of give it a quick story of what happened, I sent out an email to Kathy say, hello, my name is Isaac. I'm in high school. I'm finishing all my high school. Want to learn guitar from you, or making guitar from you. And she mentioned that these are the three things I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give you a mom talk. And here's, here are the three. I have children just like your age. And if you want to do this, first off, you have to be, have gone to guitar making school, have built guitars. Second, you have to be in a repair shop 
uh, learn how to do fret work and setup work and finish work is really, really important uh, in making guitars. It's easy to make good guitars, but it's hard to make a guitar to survive and sustain as a guitar maker. And third, you're just 18. <laughs> what are you doing? You have to be in college. <laughs> so, and so those are the three things that she just kind of gave me a you know talk. Uh, maybe she just wanted to just kind of push me away so she doesn't have to deal with a, I don't know, uh, it's just kind of, she, so she gave me a mom talk and I said, oh, if that makes sense, you know, you know, you always need to have a backup option. You just, you know, building guitars for a living is not something, it's not as romantic as it sounds. So I took her advice uh, and my first quarter uh, at college, I started going to uh, LA City College uh, just to kind of get started on what I wanted to do. But I just take uh, took a semester off uh, and started working at a restaurant for about six months, saved up ten thousand dollars. Wow, that's pretty. Uh, that's pretty good. To, that's pretty good for working at, <laughs> at a restaurant. And of course, you probably didn't yeah. have too much overhead. So no, yeah. I I had almost almost zero overhead. And yeah, I just worked all shifts, I, as many shifts as possible, lunch and dinner, wow. and just got them all done. And yeah, six months later. I went to a school, Luthery School in uh, Michigan, and I think this will be the most like world-renowned guitar making school, and it's called Gallup Guitars. Sure, uh, Luthery, uh, very, and, very well known, and uh, Brian Gallup is certainly one of the the main guys in that field. So you were going to the right place. Yeah, yes, exactly, and I, yeah, I feel very uh, blessed and grateful for that. So I went there for this journeyman program. I spent uh, spent two months there uh, from eight to five o'clock every day, Monday through Friday, building guitars, come home. There's really nothing to do. I mean, going from LA to Michigan and big rapids where you're in the woods, there was a uh, really no distraction. Just come home in my dinner, go online, look at more stuff about guitars, guitar repairs, guitar building. So I spent two months there coming back to LA and I ended up uh, finding a job on the same week I came back at a repair shop in Hollywood, uh, which that store is actually no longer there. Which store was that? But it was called Shoes Guitar Repair. It was a small repair okay. shop right across um, yeah, this uh, instrument studio rental places. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and yeah, so I, I worked there for about a year or so, but I got a job there and then I re enrolled back into LA City College to continue on my uh, units to transfer later. Now, now, when you were at the, I called, when you were working at the repair facility there, what did you learn? I learned to do a good setup. We actually had a lot of uh, clients who were highly talented people in the field, so I learned to do a good setup uh, from this repair person who's been running this shop. And of course, you make mistakes here and there, and then you learn as you are, you know, being taught from your boss. So, all right. I think the setup part of it, and then just learning to how to do a rock star setup is what he called it, is to make it everything feel good and uh, no fret buzz, low action, and then just being able to achieve that. Were you working yeah. mostly on so electric I, guitars at that time or acoustics as well? Mostly acoustic, uh, I'm sorry, mostly, mostly electric guitars. Yeah, we had a lot of electric guitars come in and, you know, go through tens of setups a day just to, yeah, just get it. Uh, going and then we also get the we had a, that studio instrument place right across the street sent us a lot of guitars to do setups and pick up installs on a lot of more of a basic technician type of stuff to get the whole shop going so that's what I did most of the uh, time at that particular uh, repair shop so that gave you some just real good basic you know hands-on knowledge about working with those aspects of the process right yeah uh, exactly so I, I think maybe about a week or so into it i actually emailed or called kathy hey, and introduced myself again I said, hi kathy this is isaac i call emailed you about a year or two ago and this is uh what I did right now, I went to Gallup School, built two guitars, and then I'm working in the repair shop and I'm uh, taking classes right now. And I just wanted to show you my guitars that I built and just get some feedback. And, you know, I had no idea uh, of how she would respond. I just really wanted to just 
show her my guitars. And she said, okay, I'll come on by. And <laughs> she gave me her address to swing by and we hung up. And later, uh, actually, as I got to start working for Kathy, she told me that her daughter, Jimmy Wingert, who does this beautiful inlay work, well, asked, asked her, said, hey, mom, what's wrong? And Kathy told her, well, I think we just got an apprentice. And that's sort of how uh, it got started, uh, working see. for Kathy. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you started doing that, and how did that, uh, how did that evolve? Well, it was, the, our arrangement was sort of an indefinite uh, apprenticeship. I was local. It's about 20 miles away from L.A., but it was still you know, trying to work apprentice under a world-class builder. Uh, that's nothing. So I was a part-time apprentice going there twice a week and then also working in the repair shop. But it, it was just, you know, every I wanted to just learn, absorb lifestyle, everything that was, you know, on Kathy. So in a couple of... My first couple of years, I didn't really touch a guitar. And my job was to really make sure that Kathy's job easier as a guitar maker and a master. So I think my first jobs were rearranging the shop, building fixtures and building tool wall around the shop to just sort of get my hands more used to working in mm -hmm. the shop. Yeah, that makes and sense. Makes sense. Yeah, and then a couple of years into it, start to process some parts that really didn't require more of a guitar le guitar expertise. Is just process, cut out some parts, cut out blocks, cut out brace stocks, and then bring them down to thickness type of thing. So as I spent more time uh, at her shop, I got to see and have my hands on on the different process of guitar making. And one of the big things that I've learned and that was a big benefit of working in this small shop was it was never a one particular job just went on for months or a year, but it was having small processes here and there throughout the whole year and then onto finishing a guitar. And also Kathy's approach to guitar making has been a big influence on me. It's not just about building a guitar. It's really fine tuning and approaching her uh, building philosophies has been uh, more influential to me than actually doing the job and executing the work. So you were there for, I think you told me, quite a while. How did that progress uh, uh, in later years? Yeah, towards the uh, later part of the year, I had more uh, hands-on experience uh, and you know, sort of working on some of her guitars. And also I started working at a repair shop uh, in Westwood Music. And I was doing a lot of re repairs and restoration projects. So a lot of this experience started to combine together and I had a couple of my project guitars so that I could also build guitar and then learn that process as well. So towards the end of my apprenticeship, I was uh, just feeling a little bit more comfortable building guitars at that point, but it wasn't, you know, there's still a lot of aspects of it that Kathy uh, had her hands on to really make sure that everything is uh, under her signature touch. And, you know, there are a few things that I never really did it myself uh, until I started building my own guitars. Right. I uh, can understand that. And, yeah. And one of the things is that uh, uh, voicing the top. And that's one of those things. Kathy wanted to actually teach me how to do it and not just doing it how she she would exactly do it. She actually taught me how to fish instead of feeding me with the fish. So it was more about learning the process of how understanding how each parts work and how its components tune into each other. And there's a lot of the intuition that goes into guitar making. And I think she was helping me to really develop those senses uh, instead of just by knowing the exact copy of a recipe, because there's really no such thing that I find uh, to have a specific recipe because each wood is different. Each parts have a different characteristics to it. So those are some of the things that I've been uh, just learning a lot and absorbing. And also she has this very artistic sense of guitars. All her lines are just very elegant and just flows all together. And she's just given me 
to develop chance to develop those senses to uh, really distinguish what looks good and what doesn't flow. And uh, I think I've been starting to develop more and more as I was uh, getting ready to build my guitars. So you told me uh, that you apprenticed with her for what, something like 10 years or? Yes, 10 years. Well, that's a pretty long yeah. time. That's a pretty long time. And and during that time where you were, were you always working someplace else too to, you know, to, to supplement? Yes. Right? Yes. I think along the way, uh, I was probably doing about four jobs. So I would apprentice at Kathy's shop and then I would work in a repair shop. And I would also uh, start well, I started teaching at a guitar making school in Hollywood. So about a couple years before I finished my apprenticeship, I was sort of a consistent four different jobs doing that. So I was teaching guitar making, apprenticing, doing repairs, and then doing my own guitars to just to kind of get it rolling. So that's usually, yeah, that's how I was able to sort of support myself to doing all of this. <laughs> so, um, so let's get to the point where this sort of apprenticeship period ends and mm -hmm. you start to get into the business of making uh, guitars under the Isaac Jang name, brand, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that happen? At what point did, did you sort of uh, uh, become your own business? I think towards the end of like eight to nine years of into apprenticeship, I didn't really have a clear vision of what I really wanted to do. I, I was just keep doing until what I was given to me at the time. And one of my uh, friends who, uh, before I, it was a friend before I even started doing guitar making, I uh, said, you know, I'm, I want you to build me a guitar and you gotta do it. And I said, I don't know if I feel comfortable building my own guitars. And he just insisted that I build him his uh, my first guitar for him. So I, as I was hesitating, he put a deposit down, <laughs> and he just do it. I said, yeah, there you so go. <laughs> I, yeah. So I, I actually built. Uh, I had to spend some time designing and picking out the wood design shapes, everything. And it took me about a year to finish a guitar for him. And you know, it has sort of a sort of preliminary design that's on there than the one that I have now to offer. But I, that's how I sort of built my first guitar that I sold on the market. And along with that, four, that was about four years ago when I finished the guitar. Uh, and I was actually hanging out at NAMM uh, at a Santa Cruz guitar house party. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was talking with uh, this guitar maker named Mike Baranek, who was also- I know who he uh, is. Yeah. I also, don't know him, but I know who yeah. he is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, who who also builds incredible guitars with just yeah fantastic artistic sense, mm -hmm. and he, yeah he was telling me, hey Isaac, how long have you been apprenticing for? I said oh, I don't know, like seven, eight, nine years. I yeah, and he asked me how many guitars have you built so far? I said well, including prototype, maybe two. <laughs> and how old are you, Isaac? And I said oh, I'm twenty seven, and that's when I and. I, he just flat out told me that I said, you, you need to build more guitars. You need to do shows. Got to just do everything. You got to, you know, just do it. He just gave me such a big push and put that fire under my belly to just push for it. I just said, okay, I, I think I should do this. And he just kept emphasizing to me that conversation that I had with him. And that right after that NAMM show, uh, I applied for a guitar show in Memphis. And it was interesting because when I called the show organizer and introduced myself and he asked me, well, he told me, it's really hard to have you give you a table with just one guitar under your belt. And I understood what that meant, but I just said, I just had to really tell him, like, I'm really gonna make sure that this is, that not to disappoint you, I'll make sure you, I make you proud. I'll really make this happen. So he just ended up said, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna give you a chance, let's do this. So about five months later, uh, I had to present a, two guitars at a show. So, you know, during those five months, I built two guitars, got ready, uh, went to a show. So that's how I had my uh, first 
debut per se mm-hmm. uh, at a show, present my guitars to the general public. And did you and, did you build something else for that show? Did you have more than one guitar to take with you, or just just one? I built two guitars. Mm-hmm. I built two guitars on spec, and you know I didn't have any buyer for it at the time, so I just built them. I just want to present them, and if I sell them, good. If I don't sell them, that's okay too. And you know, back then I didn't really have a my own shop. I was juggling between shop at Kathy's and also at, at a campus that I was teaching at. So. I was utilizing those resources to do it. And I figured eh, maybe I get a shop space in a couple of years because, you know, I, I'm probably just not going to building as many. So that was sort of what I was going for. Just build guitars, do a show like Mike told me. And, and that was about uh, and, four, you said about four years ago or? Yeah. Oh, okay. 2015 right. uh, in June. Okay. Yeah. And that show uh, was just really uh, became a big debut show for me because I sold both guitars Wow! and I received about, yeah. And I received about four orders and I started a relationship with different dealers at the time. So that's where I met my first uh, Korean dealer, my Japanese dealer, my UK dealer, and then also American dealers. And I, I, when I came back home, I just, just hit me. It was like, wait, what just happened? Is this real? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. It just, uh, you know, kind of unfolded right in front of you right there. Right. Yeah, exactly. So at that time, uh, so what had happened was my plan for setting up my shop in a few years later sort of shortened dramatically <laughs> because at that point I, I didn't, I didn't have any options to not have a shop because like I got, I got to do this now. So I started looking for a shop space and towards end of 2015, which was following the, you know, towards following that show, I had to set up a shop. So I set up my first shop in Hollywood and it happened quickly, but everything was set up and started in 2016. I started building my guitars in my own shop. And are, and you're still there now? Same place? Yes. Same place. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about getting a business going. I mean, you know, we're a business show um, mm-hmm. and uh, we always like to talk about some of the nuts and bolts or sometimes we call it inside baseball. But uh, what were some of the mm-hmm. challenges uh, that you ran into, if any, uh, kind of getting your business going? Was there anything that surprised you, anything that you ran into that you weren't expecting or did it all go very smoothly? Well, I think the capital we say uh, has been a challenge because I don't really come from a uh, financially rich uh, background, but I, a lot of the stuff I actually, uh, when I set up my shop, I had a lot of savings, not in cash, but in woods and tools and different parts and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it helped me to have that. But also what Kathy's been always been telling me is that I got to keep my overhead low to continue to sustain. Sure. So the, the, the space that I have here in Hollywood is really small, like 200 square feet, but the rent is also very affordable. And that actually allowed me to have the, have the setup a little bit more fluent. But I think a big part of it was just time management uh, because even when I set up my shop, I was still doing different uh, jobs. I was going to teach a school. I was still finishing on my apprenticeship with Kathy as my sort of last year and also build my own guitars. So trying to just juggle between those uh, time, I had to really make sure that I organized myself with a better time management. Uh, and I think that's sort of been the biggest challenge as I was starting my own business. And I've never done this before. I never set up my own business or shop. So just learning to do how to have this, this, everything was very new for me and ordering parts, making sure that I'm not, you know, in debt yeah, <laughs> too much. That's, yeah, that's always uh, a good thing. Yeah. So, but, you know, it's, it's just a constant struggle of doing that and, you know, making sure the guitar is also coming out uh, satisfactory to the receivers, uh, the customers and players. And also trying to promote my work from different uh, outlets. I think it's always been 
a new challenge for me. So you've uh, and you got these first orders, um, and obviously you had to make these guitars. Um, what? How long was it taking you to build guitars in those days? I mean, of course, it hasn't been. It's only been a few years, but um, you started off with a waiting list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I started off with the uh, waiting list. Uh, so each guitar, you know, in my new shop, it, it still took me good three to four months from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And, and I think part of it, because I also wasn't able to build guitars like full time, I had to to split my time and then come in my shop, maybe three to four days a week. And then also work, work at other places to continue to support uh, what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's usually about how much it, it took me about three to four months. And then I also had to do my finish all my own finish work to get everything uh, under control. So um, it sounds like and, and looks to me uh, and looking at your work a few days ago at the NAM show, um, it's amazing work. Uh, these are um, oh, thank you. just uh, great instruments, very, very high quality, great innovation in terms of design and and uh, just really top end. So, uh, you know, I understand a little bit about uh, the market uh, that you're in and and where you're going with it. Um, you have you had to do much uh, in the way of marketing uh, to to generate the sales? I mean, you've had a waiting list pretty much the whole time. And I understand now that you are, in fact, not even taking orders uh, right at the moment, but but that you mm -hmm. probably will be again in the in the near future, uh, just to stay on top of your waiting list. But how did word spread that um, that you that you've been able to maintain that that kind of a backlog? Uh, I I think it was a combination uh, of social media rising up during that time, and also uh, meeting and working with uh, with these wonderful dealers uh, that I've been working with, and. The way it worked out, because my dealers are promoting my work, so that really brought a lot of that attention, uh, I think, first of all, because, you know, the sh shops that they're representing has a lot more of the credential, sort of that reputation in the market. So, you know, this new young luthier coming on into the market and his shops who's been representing incredible guitar makers from all over the world for decades uh, start to carry this maker, I think has helped uh, me to or help market to see uh, my guitars. Mm -hmm. And then also the Facebook, all it's just, you know, posting pictures on Facebook. So you have a, well, you have an then, established reputation now, and even at a, at this young age that you're, you're, you have a, a backlog, even though you tell me you're producing eight to 10 guitars a year. I mean, and that's not untypical for builders of your style of instrument and uh, building them yourself. Uh, so that's a, a capacity issue. And right now it, that seems to be uh -huh. working for you. So you really haven't had to uh, sounds to me like spend a lot of time and energy in the marketing side, I would think. I mean, that's not really been a, a difficult yeah. issue other than to sort of support it, to support, uh, you know, your own work and make sure people know what you're doing and uh, the quality of the work and sort of keep uh, that reputation mm -hmm. in the forefront. Yeah, I I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm just, yeah, very thankful for that. I, I really, what I've been doing is just, posting pictures of the guitars that I finished on you know, Facebook or Instagram. And I'm actually kind of new to Instagram too. I've only picked up doing it about a couple of years ago. So it's just kind of sharing to people what I'm up to with my guitars, some of the process and things like that. And also updating them on. And it seems like a lot of people have been on board with it. And I honestly don't know what that social media is taking off to, but it's just a part of uh, sort of, opening of and sharing what I'm, what's happening in my shop. And that's also helped sort of, you know, people to see what's happening. So. What, uh, <laughs> what, do you have any sense of um, what kind of buyer is playing your guitars? Do you have any sense of who these folks are? Or is there anything that's common about any of them or is it just random? No, it's, there is a lot of variety I find. I mean, coming into 
this market, I just thought it would be people in their you know, 60s and 70s. Uh, I mean, which has been a big majority or big market for high-end uh, acoustic guitars. But it really surprised me to see there's a lot of variety. I mean, I have clients from in their late teens, early 20s, all really? the way up wow. to people in their 70s. Yeah. And I think also the people in their 30s and 40s who's been professional in their fields or people who's just working hard, saving up for a guitar, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. buying them, mm -hmm. who are enthusiastic enough to see the value of how much work goes into each guitar uh, are also buying guitars. There's yeah. a, it's an interesting aspect of the business where you have uh, professional players and you have hobbyist players mm -hmm. and uh, kind of looking at what the hobbyist players with money will buy. Uh, they're buying expensive guitars. And mm -hmm. uh, the, on the professional side, it's a little different dynamic. Uh, do you have any sense of uh, what the balance is between, say, professional players and what we would think of as hobbyist players? I would say so people who are making money playing music versus people who are doing other jobs and then. Yeah, that's one way to look at hobby. it. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. OK, uh, I have uh, several players whose main day job is playing music uh, and also. But I think the big majority of the buyers of this guitar oh my guitars, I think, are also uh, not full time musicians mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, they're they have other jobs to support uh, their guitar enthusiasm yeah, right and there's certainly uh, <laughs> you know a lot of people that have lots of guitars that uh, it's a passion and that's not where they made their money mm -hmm. that's uh, you know that's just fits into more of that sort of yeah. hobbyist realm mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what I am I've been playing for since <laughs> I was a kid and I've always, I've probably said this before on the show that I'm, I'm probably the least known non-working guitar player on the planet and, uh, <laughs> that's okay. You know, uh, there's lots of people like me, uh, and they buy, they only, they buy, buy guitars and, uh, but let's, uh, let's just sw switch a little bit and talk about, um, the recent NAMM show you and I connected up there a few days ago and very busy and very loud and uh, yes. probably one of the loudest that I've been in. This is uh, probably in, in 40 <laughs> years of going to NAMM shows. Uh, this was, it seemed to me like the loudest one I'd ever been to. And uh, yeah. it, there must have there must have been mm -hmm. some rattling going on because I saw uh, several emails coming from NAMM, warning emails about the sound, uh, yeah. one right after another. You might have seen them too, but but somebody must have yes. been uh, aware that it was really loud. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was, it, yeah, it was really loud. And then I guess it's good for my acoustic guitars because all that noise really helped uh, break in my instruments. Oh, so, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Now, now like you, free, uh, free, uh -huh. you had, th you had uh, a couple of guitars that I saw there with this beautiful shape to them and whatnot. And then I, I did see sold signs on, uh, were those guitars sold at the show or were they previously sold before you got there? They were previously sold before the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, this particular uh, guitars were actually taken order to be delivered at the show. And, I reached out to some of my buyers and I asked them if they wanted to take that slot uh, previously. So that's how it worked out oh, because, okay. you know, build, yeah, building so many guitars a year, I really couldn't uh, sort of arrange my time to build more guitars for the show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they came to the show and the deal was that I display them for the whole duration of the show. And then they picked it up uh, after the show's over and then that's when I get paid. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. So uh, tell me a little bit about what your experience was there. You were part of the uh, uh, the Boutique Guitar Showcase mm -hmm. run by uh, yes. ja Jamie Gale, who we've had on the show. And uh, oh. uh, we had him on, gosh, months ago, many months ago. I forget mm -hmm. which episode, but probably in the teens somewhere. And uh, um, uh -huh. that was after uh, uh, they did the showcase last year. 
but it's a it's mm-hmm. quite a a great innovation and something that uh, they probably should have been doing a long time ago. And every time that I came into the showcase, which was a bunch of times uh, over those three mm-hmm. days that I was there, it was really busy. Yeah. It was always really busy in the boutique guitar oh, showcase. Man. Is that was that your impression too? Was you know did it seem like it was always busy? Oh yes. Yeah, I mean, I've been coming to Nam as a either visitor or buying other supplies for past ten years or so, mm-hmm. and this is the boutique guitar showcase has been going on for three years, and I've been to all this all three actually, first as a helper to uh, my friend and who's an incredible builder, Michi Matsuda. Oh uh, sure, I know. Who, yeah, he's uh, a, he's he's an amazing builder, amazing. He's yeah, he's one of my heroes. I yeah. Mean, he's yeah, very creative, so, just really creative. But but there was a lot of those there. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of creative stuff there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, I came to help him out on the first show and then I displayed on the second uh, one which was last year and then I this is my third. So their third show here and it's it's crazy. Yeah. It's like uh doing five guitar shows in one guitar show. Uh I'm constantly talking. I probably talk to close to hundred people a day. I'm like, I'm not even exaggerating. I think it's just, just constant people coming in and looking at guitars, talking to them and talking about guitars, having them check them out. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a long, a lot of energy that goes into it. So I had to have a couple cans, a cup of coffee <laughs> a day just to kind of keep it energized and <laughs> keep it rolling. How would, how would it, you, it was, it, I was going to say is how would you describe the result of it? What do you think you got out of it? It's always hard to tell uh, because this show, I went not accepting orders or new orders, uh, but just to really uh, present to, uh, my guitars to the public. And, and that's one of my, you know, sort of approach is, you know, there's only one dimension to seeing a guitar online, uh, a picture or even sound clips, it helps to get an idea, but that's just, uh, I think you have, I find that you have to experience a guitar. You know, you gotta see it closely in person, feel it, play it, hear it. So I, that, that was my intention of uh, bringing in to the show and Right now, you know, I get a lot of inquiries from also more more dealers and also different buyers wanting to be on the list uh, to to take orders. So, and then also many different people coming, taking pictures, you know, people from the magazine and different medias. And uh, this particular name here, Mem, just made a brand film for this 2019. Mm-hmm. And they fil- filmed the, some, some portions of that in my shop. Oh, really? I'm in there, oh. so I feel yeah, nice. I feel super nice. honored to be in there. But watching me th- in the in the film was really cringing. But it was yeah. So that was also a big part of uh, what I feel you know that I benefited from being in the uh, Nam show. So it sounds like it all kind of contributed to this um, evolution, this development of Isaac Jang as. You know, one of the I can't even say that you're an up and coming builder anymore because you're past that. You're really in, I, you, you know, you're kind of in the in the thick of it right now. You've got a waiting list to get on the waiting list. Uh, uh, you know, you've built um, almost 30 guitars or so, you say, in the last few years. And yes. And you're backed up. You're not even taking orders right now. So I guess that gets me to this point in the interview where I want to ask you kind of how you see the future and, and where you, you see yourself going. Uh, you know, there's there's always the issue of when you get to a certain point of notoriety and and uh, demand is to try to get a little bigger and do more and that sort of thing. But, you know, how do you see how do you see things going forward? Well, it, I can't say that I've I can't say that I've arrived somewhere right now. Just, you know, I'm just sort of still in the progress of continuing to, you know, refine my guitars and building guitars. And also there are many guitar makers in the business who's been building for 30, 40 plus years. That's true. Who's also paved the way for a lot of the younger builders uh, like me 
because I mean, in their generations, you know, handmade guitars were not accepted in the music stores. They were just like, no, it's all, all, you know, all about the bigger factory guitars. So they paved the way for us, and I've seen them continuing to progress and refining instruments to really bring up to the higher uh, level. Um, and what I want to see myself in the future is just continue to uh, doing what I'm doing now and just continue to progress and refine my instruments. I'm not really uh, particularly looking to increase in the numbers of the guitars that I make, but just try to explore and build more different build instruments that I like and also try to also diff- explore into the, the different aesthetics as well, just to uh, keep pushing myself to different challenges and uh, newer concepts. But that's kind of what I'm seeing myself in the next five, 10 years. Uh, well, and, and, and you're still a young, a young guy. So from my perspective, mm-hmm. and I think of myself as still reasonably young, sort of middle-aged guy, and although I would get some argument on that, but uh, it's okay. Uh, it's all about how you see yourself. And but the, but the good news is you do have a lot ahead of you, and you have a, a lot of opportunity to go just about anywhere you want to go uh, with it, and especially with the kind of talent and uh, knowledge that you have at this stage. It's only going to get better. You have a lot to look forward to, and I think the market has a lot to look forward to as well. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Yeah, I'm just grateful to be. Uh, you know, at where I am right now. And there are has there have been so many wonderful people around me who's really supported me, pushed me, and inspired me to be uh, where I am right now to continue on. Yeah. And continue to press on. I want to give a little like shout out uh, to uh, Megan Wells, who uh, was the first to uh, to tell me that. I should interview Isaac Jang, and, uh, and that, oh, that was, uh, so cool. I think she was on way back in the beginning of the show, probably around episode, I don't know, eight or nine or something like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was way back then that she had mentioned your name. And uh, so it finally came to pass oh. that we have you on the show. And I just know that uh, there's going to be great things to come, and we're certainly going to going to keep an eye out for you. And I'm really, really happy that you were able to come on, that we were able to meet at uh, the NAM show and, and get this all worked out on fairly short notice. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you again and seeing what you're producing. Oh, man, thank you so much for having me on board uh, here. And also thank you, Megan, for really introducing me to this uh, awesome guitar business radio and it was <laughs> yeah it was a pleasure talking with you it was just kind of also helped me to rethink oh this is i guess where i've been uh, walking from and coming to where i am and this is what i would do in the future well i'm, <laughs> I'm sure yeah. that uh you know our listeners will enjoy it everybody gets something out of these uh what we call them long form interviews and uh you know it's it's all you know, for me, it's incredibly interesting, and uh, I'm very lucky to be able to have this opportunity to do these things. So I'm kind of living the dream, too, my friend. So let's stay in touch, and uh, I look forward to uh, chatting with you again. Great. Thank you so much, and uh, happy have a good, great evening. So what did you think of the interview with Isaac Jang? We always want to hear from you, and you can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business, at Guitar Business, or email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And of course, if none of that works for you, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888-777-777. 2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later. Operators are supposed to be standing by, quite patiently, I assume. So, like I said at the front of the show, Guitar Business Media just introduced at Winter NAM a brand new platform called Guitar Careers. Now, this has been in the works for a while, along with several other projects that are still incubating, but Guitar Careers is all about facilitating opportunity pathways for the guitar universe and through three different channels, work, learn, and support. Now, the rollout of this is staggered, and our first active channel is work. We've built a really high-powered listing board that will feature all kinds of opportunities, including full and part-time jobs, freelance opportunities, gigs, temporary and contract work, and others if they exist. 
Now, this is going to take some time, but, you know, you have to start somewhere. So there are some opportunities already listed. And to move things along a little faster, we're offering some incentives to participate, like free profile pages and free ads for companies and organizations. You'll need a promo code for the free ads, so just ask us for those and you shall receive it. And for opportunity seekers, you can sign up right now for free opportunity alerts and be notified when something comes along that you might be interested in. Bottom line, Guitar Careers is about opportunities for the business of guitar. Sound familiar? It should. It's what we're all about and totally consistent with our mission. So if you listened to the back of the show last week, you'll know I talked a bit about the first year of GBR and the fact that we tried a lot of new things along the way, which I referred to as spaghetti. It's a common metaphor, throwing it against the wall and seeing what sticks. And a lot of things, well, they didn't stick. But the things that did are the building blocks that advance our cause. And for Guitar Business Media, the noodles are just a little bit bigger. We're slowly and steadily building an organization that is dedicated to making a significant contribution to the business of guitar in as many ways as we sensibly can. Some of our endeavors will be successful, maybe wildly so. Others will not. But as long as we're not taking more steps backwards than forward, we'll be fine. So far, we're well ahead of the game. But there's no guarantee that guitar careers will be the success we're looking for, but we're optimistic. And why shouldn't we be? It makes sense. But nobody said it would be easy. None of this has been easy. It's been a grind all the way. I started Guitar PR 11 years ago, and honestly, it took 10 years to finally get the traction I had been looking for all along. Sometimes it just takes time and persistence well beyond what we ever thought possible or necessary. And there are always questions and doubts along the way, not to mention the naysayers, but for those of you who've had the experience of sticking with something you believe in through hell and high water to finally realize the fruits of your commitment, you know what that feels like. And for all the rest of you, my advice is always the same. Stay positive, stay focused on your destination or destinations, but keep all your options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again on episode 52. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com.